Hi everyone, thanks so much for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff and I'll be your host for the show. Before we bring on tonight's guest, if you've had a Dogman Encounter and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. If you've had a Sasquatch sighting and would like to be a guest on Bigfoot Eyewitness Radio, please go to bigfooteyewitness.com and submit a report. All right, let's bring on tonight's guest. Tonight's guest is Paul Levins. Paul, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Vic. I'm glad to be here. Oh, it's great having you. Paul, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Well, I am a guy that grew up as an Army brat. And uh, in my early years, I spent at least 12 years of my life maybe 13, living in, in Europe and Germany. And, uh, you know, in between that, you know, my father, he would have to go to Vietnam, and then we'd go to Wisconsin, up where my mother's parents are from. Well, actually, they're from Germany, too. They're all Germans. But uh, we'd live up there, and then we'd move back to Germany and stay there for three more years. But uh, most of my toddler life and preteen life was living in Europe, and uh, that's where I had my encounter. Eventually, you know, I joined the Army. Well, before that, I was actually, you know, I grew up in northwest Florida, and when my father retired out of the Army, you know, I started working on the oil rigs and stuff like that, and uh, at an early age, I started deer hunting. And I started going out in the woods hunting deer with neighbors that live close by. And I started learning how to do that and understanding animals and the mannerisms of animals and things like that. And uh, learned how to kill animals. I didn't necessarily always enjoy it, but growing up where I did, you know, if you were a guy, you know, you kind of had to do that because that's what made you what you were. You know, but you did it in a respectful manner and you didn't do things in a mean way. And, uh, you know, just like a lot of people that, that you hear from, you know, I like to fish every once in a while. Don't really like that too much, but I can catch them, you know, and I'm not a bad fisherman if I have to. But um, eventually I joined the Army and I stayed there for 20 years. I wanted to jump out of airplanes like my father did and uh i did that i was in the 82nd airborne 101st airborne went to long range surveillance leaders course i was in the uh army recon for three and a half years and eventually went to german ranger school which was fun and then i went to american ranger school which sucked and um never do that again but well, I won't have to because I'm retired now. But uh, anyway, so uh, those are my experiences, you know, as an adult. But as a child, a 12 year old, I had an encounter with something that a lot of people are seeing these days. And um, whenever I saw this thing, don't know what it was. And I'm a recon guy. I don't say what I'm seeing. I just tell people what it looks like and they figure out what it is. And I guess I've always been that way. But I saw something and uh forever it's been on my mind. You know, but when I saw it, there was a friend of mine that was with me and we both seen the thing. And um after that night was over with we never talked about it again. And um it, it, it was strange because back in those days, in the early 70s, we didn't have computers and we didn't have nothing you could go by, you know, and for what some people like to call these things, Hollywood, you know, every once in a while would show you a movie about something like this and it just looked like a monkey on steroids. And um, what I saw after about, well, you know, I, like I said, I put it out of my mind for years because I couldn't explain it and I didn't think anybody would believe me. And I'm sure my friend felt the same way. And um, 
you know, eventually my dad got reassigned and we come back to the States and my life started in a different direction. But um, around 2008 or 2009 at work, I was uh, cruising the Internet and I came across this story. It was a Fox News story with Sean Hannity. He was covering a story and it was about the Beast of Bray Road. And there was a female journalist, her name was Linda Godfrey, and she had been covering this for quite some time. And Sean was interviewing her. And um, I got to thinking and, you know, listening to this story and what it was about. And I says, you know, I saw something like that. I surely did. And for some reason, it just, you know, I'm getting older now in life and it shot a lightning bolt of energy in me. When made me excited, you know, wow, finally, I'm not crazy anymore. And I thought I was nuts because of what I saw. But had I not ever seen one of these things, I wouldn't think that they exist. I would be like everybody else that hears a bump in the night outside their house and thinks they have to go out there and investigate. Now I know there's a reason for everything that goes bump in the night. And uh, it's been with us for a long time. I really believe it. And I have been researching this since the Hannity thing. And I have found all kind of interesting information. That's not, you know, you get into this and there's a bunch of hokey stuff too. A bunch of made up stuff and you have to kind of read between the lines and, and listen to how people are talking and what they're saying. You know, and you can always throw in a, well, what about that camcorder you said you had in your yard? How come it didn't see nothing? So you're always throwing those questions up. And I had to go back to the original thing. Had I not seen it, I wouldn't believe it exists. But I did see it. And I know they're here. And I don't know what they are, but whatever it was, it was big and it wasn't mean. It didn't show any type of uh, hostility toward me and my friend. And um, it checked us out and it got out of there. As a 12-year-old, I'm living in a place in Europe, and it's a very remote area, a place where most soldiers back in them days that were in the military did not want to get stationed at. It was a remote area had really bad weather because there were a lot of hills and stuff around that kept clouds and fog and stuff like that. You know, we'd get snow in May, okay? That wasn't a crazy thing. We'd get snow in, in the month of May over there. But during World War II, this particular base, and the name of it was called Wild Flecken, okay? Wild Flecken, exactly the way it sounds. That's how you'd spell it, wild and the word flecken. And it was very picturesque, just exactly the way you would think Europe would be. Rolling hills, heavy forests, not just pine trees, but big giant oaks, ancient woods, and lots of rocky creeks where there would be trout. In fact, you know, I was a Boy Scout back then, and, you know, all of us had our fishing license, and, um, we would actually, there were so many trout in the creek around those areas, you could actually flip them out of the creek with your hands. Okay, that's the kind of area it was. In a World War II, it had a sinister history to it. The Waffen SS used to be stationed there, and the Waffen SS was the fighting side of the German SS. German SS in World War II, they were very hardcore political types and um kind of like a bunch of army rangers in the american army as far as their hardcoreness is and um they push them to the worst part of the fight that's how tough they were but there there was a munitions plant there and this whole base was camouflaged during the second world war it was all wooded and everything and um not too far from where my friend and I were camping this, on this particular night. About a mile away was an old Jewish cemetery. And 
that cemetery was, you know, they had a lot of Polish Jews that were displaced after the war. And a lot of them were so weak and emaciated that they just died. These poor people died and they buried them there. So in all the research I've done about these things, about the graveyard is they like graveyards. So, well, there was one right there. I don't really know if they like them, but there was one not too far from where we were camping. Okay, so this is in November of 1972. All right, and it's probably 9, 30, 10 o'clock. It's on a weekend, Europe. All right, and it's wet. It wasn't raining, but it's always wet there in the November time frame. So my friend and I, we were camping. Both of our fathers were in the American Army. So we had their sleeping bags, their military sleeping bags, and we had some of their equipment out there. And we had a fire going. And uh, my friend, where we were at, it was like a little opening in the woods, like a horseshoe. If you were to take a horseshoe and lay it on the edge of a wood line and form a little U shape in there with a small opening. And it was probably 20 or 30 feet in diameter, enough for us to be able to walk around in, surrounded by tall planted pines and um, pretty dense, pretty dense on the outskirts. My friend is sitting Indian cross-legged like Indians, you'd think an Indian would, you know, sitting on the other side of the fire with his legs crossed. And um, I always had a knife when I was a kid and I still do. I'm a knife freak, you know, so I'm chopping on a limb or something facing away from them and we're talking and um we didn't hear any noises other than our fire popping you know how it is when you got a fire going sometimes the woods making that popping sound and stuff and um this thing this big thing just steps forward and there wasn't enough time for any of us to be afraid but it was definitely something that we had never seen before now here's what you've got a picture in your mind and this to me is the important thing of all of what I'm telling you standing less than a foot and a half away from me I could have reached over and touched it was this it was almost a, like a German Shepherd Okay, and it was at least five times the size of a German Shepherd, not all big and bulky like an ape, but very lean and mean and tall. Okay, like an athlete, like a sprinter, like a quarter miler, somebody that runs all the way around the track, somebody the big chest and big legs and, you know, an athlete. Okay, and here it is. It's standing right in front of me, and I'm, it, it, it looks just like a German Shepherd but it's standing on its hind legs. And the first thing I noticed when it stepped forward, I looked up and I seen this big head and it was a big dog's head, like a German shepherd's head and really tall and pointed ears on the top of its head. They weren't drooping and I, and it was dark. So I didn't notice if they were moving back and forth. They didn't need to because anything that was making noise was standing right in front of it. That was, me and my friend, and um, I'm looking at this thing, and I'm thinking, goodness, what is it? What is this? And and I looked down, I looked all the way down, and I noticed the tail, and I looked back up again, and now I'm looking at its big shoulders. It's It's got very wide shoulders, a deep chest, and I can see it almost from an oblique view, where I can see its belly, a little bit and most of his back the back appeared to have a hump on it like in between the shoulder blades and the shoulders were wide wider than any grown man that I had ever seen at my age and um, I'm looking down and the hair on its back is probably about as long as your fingers just like on a German Shepherd maybe two three inches in in length, nothing was shaggy or hanging like a ghillie suit or something like that. You know, a ghillie suit, something military people wear the camouflage with. 
no hanging, nothing. It was all very nice two or three inch hair like that, but it was thicker on the back and it was dark and it was black like on the back. But I couldn't tell for sure because it was dark. But I do know that the belly and that was what was facing the fire, looking at my friend sitting across from the fire. It was light in color. OK, this animal's waist, it tapered down to maybe a, I don't know, 30, 36 inch waist. I mean, this thing was tall. It was at least seven feet tall. And back then I was about five feet tall and it was towering way over us. But it had a very narrow waist and the legs looking down at the legs, they did have like the hind legs of a dog where the knee is backwards like. OK, but they weren't narrow like. Um, you know, like you notice, a, a you know, a good sized dog laying down in front of you, those legs were as thick as at least a four inch PVC pipe where they connected to the feet and um the feet were at least it it seemed to me they were about like a paper plate they were kind of big but the whole animal was very lean now getting back up to its upper arms okay and the length of its arms the arms were very long all right and um where they bent at the elbows, that from, you know, that's our ulna and radius in our arms, okay? Those two bones, you know, where your thumb is, that's your radius, and the other one's the ulna, the one underneath. And it seemed that area was a lot longer than ours. Now, the, the hands or whatever they were, palms or paws, they were facing, the palm was facing downwards on both arms. Right? I'm, I'm not sure, but it appeared that both arms were bent at the elbows, palms facing down, and the flanges, the fingers, or if there were any, seemed, there seemed to be something there like that. I didn't notice a thumb, but they were like pointed down, like kind of limp, like if you were joking around about somebody standing limp wrist. Okay, that's the way it was standing with its fingers pointing down, if they were fingers at all. And it was looking at, and my friend Tommy sitting across the fire. I don't know why it wasn't looking at me, probably because it's probably looking at me for a while before it, I even noticed it. But doing all the research that I've done on these things, I didn't notice a smell. Of course, we had a fire going and in Europe, November time frame, wet, everything's wet. So the woods always stink anyways. It's not a stink stink. It's a nice smell, you know leaves and things like that but um i didn't notice the wet dog smell i didn't notice the uh urine and the blood or rotten meat smell or anything like that but it just stood there and it was looking down and it, and the way it appeared was what am i doing here now i don't want to call this thing a werewolf because it didn't act like what we think a werewolf would act like what we know a werewolf acts like is is a beast that can't control itself and all it wants to do is kill and eat well this thing could have but it didn't but whatever it was it was bad enough it, it could have put a bad hurting on us okay if it wanted to but it didn't and to this day you know, I know about the Gugways from Native American lore, and I know about the Face Eaters from Native American lore. It wasn't anything like that, or I don't think it was. I don't know if they got to get mad enough to be that way, but it could have been, but it wasn't. It looked at us. It looked at Tommy mainly, and it took a step forward, and all this time, this is about six to ten seconds that it's standing right there by me. And like I said, I, I didn't have enough time to be afraid because I didn't really know what I was looking at because it looked just like a German shepherd. But it was big and it was at least seven feet tall. And um, it could have hurt us, but it didn't. But it was like, what am I doing here? That That's 
when I look, when I think about it, that's what it looked like. I didn't see any teeth. I, I do remember that big head. And just picture a German shepherd's head about five times the size of a regular German shepherd's head. And it took one step forward. It stepped over the fire. And then with its other leg, it stepped over Tommy and it took off through that opening. It was a big wide open area, like a big field that led to the military housing area where we lived at. And it just ran away. And I'm telling you, the way it looked, it had to have been, oh, I know it was more than 250 pounds because I'm 5'11", and I'm not no muscled up beast. I'm 60 years old, and and I got me a belly, and I weigh 200 pounds now, but I'm not nothing like what that thing is or was. 250 to 300 and some odd pounds is what I think this thing might have weighed. And it was gone when it took off. It was gone. I've never seen an animal that big move that fast. And um, I do believe as long as the front arms were, if you can call them arms, I don't know what to call them, you know, wish somebody else could name it for me. But I believe it can run on its front legs and hind legs at the same time. That's the way it was built. And that's why I think it had that hump on its back. It wasn't like a humpback or a freak. It had a wide set of shoulders, but there was a hump like in the middle of the scapulas. And um, I think this thing can do all kind of stuff. I think it could climb a tree. I think it can do anything. And I do believe the way it was behaving, and from what I can remember, it seemed to have some kind of knowledge like oh these are two boys what am i doing here in front of two boys this ain't what i'm supposed to be here for let me go and take care of that business but if it was going to come back we didn't give it enough time to want to come back because as soon as we saw it the both of us looked at it and looked at each other and said what the h was that and without even saying anything else we just took off and we run in the same direction it went, not even thinking anything, and made it all the way to his house and slept in his basement because we didn't want to tell the dads, hey, we left all your gear out there that they know if we lost, they'd have had to pay for, you know. So the next day we went out and got him, and we didn't even look for tracks. I just don't understand it. But that's how, you know, growing up in the 70s, you're not a toddler anymore. You're in your preteens and you're getting to the point where your parents only expect you to do what they say and not listen to really anything you got to say, especially in them times in the seventies, you know, pretty much didn't say nothing until you were spoken to. But anyways, that's, uh, that's what I wanted to share with everybody. And I, I wanted to share what it looked like. And how close it was and that it wasn't mean. I know there's different types, but I'm not sure which one I saw, but it surely wasn't the Gugway. So I did buy myself a rifle to deal with one of those if I ever had to. And I bought myself a Marlin GBL 4570 lever action rifle that'll generate up to 1600 pounds of knockdown power at 100 yards but i'll tell you this i don't think if one was after you unless you were in the middle of an open field and knew it was coming that you'd have a chance to deal with it they're just that fast they're so fast and they can move so quietly among the trees because we were in some dense woods and didn't hear it even come don't know how long it was standing there looking at me before it stepped out and let the both of us see them. But they're magnificent. They are. They're, it, it's, it's a magnificent animal. But I don't know if we're supposed to think of them that way. But it just didn't seem like it was all animal. It was uh, on its hind legs running around like we do. 
and it seemed extremely intelligent. And deep, deep down inside from everything I've been researching, I think the government knows about them. I really do. I don't see how something like this can exist, and only a few of us have seen them. And I'll tell you this, folks. Unless it was mean, and unless you were defending your children or yourself, and you were in fear of your life, I wouldn't shoot at one. There's no reason to. It's something, just like we are. And if I can hold my right hand up to it, and let it see that there's nothing in my hand, I'll do that. Now, I'm not a tree hugger. I'm a former paratrooper and recon guy. I don't, I'm not a tree hugger. But uh recon guys are kind of hippies, you know. But I'm not going to just kill something because I can. And I'm not going to not kill it because I'm afraid of it. But if I'd have had more time, I might have said, hey, why don't you sit down and have some beef jerky with us, you know, and talk to us. Because it kind of looked like it could do all that, but I don't know. I might just be putting too much into it, but. I'm just happy to be able to share this with everybody. This happened a long time ago, and I've been digging into this stuff for since 2008, 2009. I'm happy there's other people that see these things. I hope they don't hurt nobody. And um, maybe sometime we can find out what it is. That would be cool because it's a magnificent thing. I don't know if we want to go around looking for them, but I guess they just got to find you and hopefully you'll have an experience like I did. But it's been a pleasure for me to be able to tell you all about it and uh almost makes me emotional because, you know, all I got to tell anybody is uh my son and he he's like, hey, Dad, don't be telling nobody that crazy story. Or some of my students. I'm a land survival instructor for the Navy. I teach land survival to naval aviators and um, I saw one. And I uh, just want you all to know they're there and I don't think all of them are bad but you got to figure it out for yourself and see how you feel. Don't be naive and running around thinking you can put a collar on them and make a pet out of it because it's a big predator. It's an apex predator. The way it's built and set up, it ain't no joke, folks. But I saw one, and I'm happy to be able to share that with you. Well, we're glad you came on and shared your encounter with us. Thanks for doing this. Before we move on with the interview, Paul, I want to thank you for your service to our country. Well, thank you, Vic. I, I volunteered, you know, and I was happy to do it. You know, my father did it before me, and I just thought it was part of me. And now my hard-headed son is in the 82nd Airborne, and um, if he ever finds out I've done this, he's going to be lecturing me, hey, Dad, you shouldn't have done that. I just can't wait till he sees one and hope it's the same kind of experience I had. And then he can say, gee, Dad. Just like he does for everything else. You were right about that. But I, I appreciate you giving me the time, Vic. And, you know, I've heard your show and enjoy the way you speak to people. You give them a chance and, and allow them to get it off their chest. I almost feel like I sinned somehow. And it was something a burden stuck on me, like a big mystery that I had to find out. But I don't have the power to do it. And I feel better knowing that there's other people that have seen these things and um, people like you that will allow us to speak, you know, and it just makes me feel good to know that, you know, it just, it just, it, I don't know. It's kind of emotional for me because I never thought I'd have the chance to talk to an audience. I don't know what the response will be. I just hope that people can get out of it what I got out of it. I saw what it looked like, and it's what a lot of people have seen, you know, and that's the important part. And I just wanted to contribute to that. 
Well, I'm glad that you feel so much better after having shared it like this. That's great news. Since you were so close to it, but only had a side view, did you ever get to see its eyes? That's one thing I did not get to see, the teeth or the eyes. Okay. And of course it was dark and it was, its head was up higher. I was in planted pines at the time and the pines were pretty close together. So, um, he was kind of up there, so he wasn't looking directly at me. But that is one of the reasons I've been trying to get a hold of my friend. And I've been looking. Even one of my ex-wives was trying to help me find him. And um, I've been looking for him. But what I've noticed are a lot of my friends aren't around no more. And I don't know why I've stuck around this long. I guess Big Ranger's got some more tasks for me to do. I just hope he can tell me because... You got to slap me in the face for me to take a hint, but I just I haven't been able to find him. He would have been able to answer that question because he was looking right at him in the front. And I never did. You know, we were just 12 year old boys and I never did say, hey, was it a boy or a girl? That thought never came to me. But I have heard other interviews where that question was asked and some people were able to say yes or no. But that is the one thing. You know, when I think about it, I never got to see the amber eyes. And in some ways, from what I've heard, maybe I'm happy I didn't because I hear they can look right through you. But that's the part about what I noticed, how it behaved. I mean, it was like something that big, and it wasn't a person, okay, but it was that big and huge to where it could have grabbed me by the neck. I was that close to it and could have reached over and grabbed up my friend and grabbed him by the neck or done whatever and picked him up off the ground and run off with us. But this thing, it was like a gentleman or a gentle thing. It could have done that, but it didn't. So that kind of helps me to understand when people say, Yep, I looked in its eyes and it looked like it could see my heart. And um, it sort of behaved that it would have that kind of common sense or that type of behavior that it wasn't there to do mayhem and whatever. But I don't want everybody to think and be naive because I've heard other stories. I don't want everybody to be naive and think, well, I shouldn't fear that. You know, I'll just open up another sleeping bag for one. You know, I don't know if you should be that way, but I don't think you have to show open hostility if you have the chance to encounter one like I did. And I've heard stories where they've charged people and guy had a Bowie knife and the thing recognized what the Bowie knife was and held him off for two hours, you know, and all the while, it was circling around throughout the night until two, three hours later, all the crickets came back, all the animal sounds came back, and it was gone. I, I don't want everybody to think, well, it's just like Mickey Mouse. It's a Disney character. You know, I don't want everybody to think that. It's something to be respected. That is for sure. And it's just like us being here on Earth. Earth is here for us, but we're here to manage things and to treat things the way they should be treated. But I just wished I had seen the eyes because that's what everybody talks about are the amber eyes. But I do think the thing was extremely intelligent because it didn't act like a crazy animal. It acted like, what am I doing here? Goodness, here's two boys. I don't want to see two boys. You know, I don't want them to see me neither. Let me get out of here. And that's what it did. And it didn't leave a big memory other than what me and Tommy saw, not enough to call the police not enough to run and get our parents of course they wouldn't have believed us anyways but unless they'd have seen it but you know who knows but i just wished i'd have seen them eyes it's an amazing animal whatever it is and i don't i'm a recon guy we don't determine what we see we tell people what we saw and they determine what it is i know what i'd like to call it but it doesn't have the same characteristics and then I do know there's different types, and apparently it probably wasn't a gugway or 
a face eater because it definitely didn't eat our faces. We still had to go through puberty and pimples and all that stuff on our own without having something chewing on us. So it's an amazing thing. And I hope if we do find them and are able to catch one, we don't stick it in a pen like they do on a zoo. And then they just let it be. Try to understand it and let it be. You might not have seen its eyes, but you did share a lot of other great details with us, so that's still awfully impressive. You told us how big its head was, but was its head in proportion to the size of its body? It didn't seem like it was too heavy for it to carry because of how wide the shoulders were. Now, I didn't notice a lot of neck, but there was something there because there was a lot of hair. And I think that's where the hump was, dead center in between the scalpula. And um, the neck came up from there. And the back of the head didn't really have a lump there. It was more straight. And straight up from the back of the head, that's where the ears come straight up from. And I would guess from the back of the head to the end of the snout was probably about two feet, about 24 inches, I'm guessing. But I'm just guessing that from a 12-year-old boy's thoughts back in 1972. It was a good size head, but it didn't seem like it had any trouble running around with it. It didn't seem like a bobblehead at all, not at all. It was proportioned because, like I said, he was like a quarter-mile sprinter, somebody like that, a quarter-miler. He's not a skinny guy. And um, he ain't a fat one neither, but he was lean and mean, like what I would call a fighting machine, something like if Bruce Lee was a werewolf. That's what he'd look like. But the head was. It was a big old head. It was I, you know, later on in life, I ended up getting an Airedale Terrier and uh, that was a huge dog and he had a big head and uh, his head wasn't nowhere big as that thing that I saw. And my dog, he was 95 pounds, you know, and he had a huge head. A lot of people thought he, they used to think he was a wolfhound because he had all that wiry old hair on him. But that'd be the right kind of dog to chase one of these things, I think. I don't know if he could deal with it, but you need about five of them Airedale Terriers. But I wouldn't want to chase one. I just like to know they're there and maybe watch them so I could understand them. But it didn't look like he had no trouble toting his head around her, Vic. Toting in the South means carrying. <laughs> it means that in the North, too. <laughs> oh, yeah? Okay. <laughs> it sure does. No, that's okay. No harm, no foul. You described his fingers, but did you see claws on the tips of his fingers? I didn't really notice, and I, I wasn't paying that much attention. I just noticed that the flanges, if they were flanges, they were pointed downward like he was limp rest, you know, or it was limp rest. I didn't notice any kind of claws or anything, but it was longer than if you were just looking at a dog paw because a dog paw would stop right there at the end of the pads. But whatever this was, they were hanging down further. And like I said, I couldn't tell if there was a thumb because the radius, that's the bone on top of your where your thumb is that was the way he was holding his arms or whatever they were were right there next to his body palms facing down so that would mean the thumbs would have been inside so i didn't notice any claws but there was something long there you know like fingers or or something hanging there but uh it just wasn't there that long it was about 10 seconds and i was more in awe of its back and its legs and the tail for some reason the tail really got my attention because i was thinking goodness what kind of thing are you you got a big old tail and that's what made me think i mean because it i'm telling you vic it looked like a german shepherd but five times size and thicker thicker like if you were to put a Olympic type athlete into a, a suit that was like 
stretchy pants, yoga pants, and everything conformed except there was hair on the outside. You know, the legs, they were like, when they connected to the feet area, they were about like the size of a four inch PVC pipe. And the feet were like, and these are the ones he's standing on, they were like the size of a paper plate. But probably because it was dark is why I didn't notice claws. But I did notice the other stuff. The length of the hair wasn't really shaggy. It was about the same as you would think when you saw the dog, but well behaved as it could be for whatever it was. But for a split second, I did say werewolf because, you know, when I was a kid, it was the scariest monster. But that was always a monster you wanted to go see in the movies. But you didn't want to walk home from the movies at nighttime because of what you just saw. But that was always the one you wanted to see. But it just didn't behave that way. It didn't. And uh, I was in awe of it. And I still am because it was a magnificent animal. It was an athlete, just like an animal from the wild, a little bit bigger than man size. but very well proportioned like an athlete not a clumsy old gorilla like thing and even gorillas aren't clumsy but wasn't clumsy like a bear let's say he could have danced he could have done the hokey pokey he could have danced he could have done the tom Cochran life as a highway dance playing as les paul that's how well built he was it was just a magnificent animal i'd never want to have to fight something like that because i just don't like i've said before I just don't think you'd be fast enough to deal with it. You'd want a wall behind you so you could have it coming straight to you and nothing behind you. Just like when somebody breaks in your house, you're getting the corner, get your phone, got your handgun in your hand, you call 911, let them come to you. That's the way it would be if I had to deal with one. And I've dealt with things before, people, but I don't think a people are as smart as something like that because you know you're dealing with something that can smell you can know when you're afraid can hear your heartbeat you can't hide from it it knows everything about you just by smelling you and it's, it's just a magnificent thing and i just can't get over being able to tell people about it and uh one day i'm going to see another one because for some reason, people that have seen them before, it's like seeing a snake. When you go out in the woods, there's some people that are just blind to everything, especially in the times of cell phones where nobody pays attention to their surroundings. But once you see a snake, you'll always see a snake. You know, you can determine a snake from a root on the ground just from a glance. Once you see one, you'll always see it. Because it's like when I was deer hunting as a, as a kid. You know, I started deer hunting when I was in ninth grade. And um, I never killed a deer until after I graduated high school. Because I never knew what I was looking for. Nobody ever told me that part. You're looking for a large dog, dude. Here I'm in northwest Florida looking for white-tailed deer thinking I'm going to find an elk. You know, and one day I see a belly. I see four legs attached to it. I see a tail twitching, and then I go up the body, and I see an ear twitching. And there it is. And once you see it, you can always pick them out. And I believe I've been blessed with being able to see one. Even though I saw the one I saw in the dark, I still know what I'm looking for, and I know they're fast. And when you see shadows, it might be that. Of course, i seen a shadow at 4 o'clock in the morning. I'm taking a shower this morning in my bathtub. So I don't know what that was, but there ain't no dog man in my house. <laughs> but I don't think your house could hold one. They're too big. He'd be bumping his head, slipping around on the wooden floor because he wasn't getting no grips. It, he wouldn't be comfortable. He's got to be outside running on the leaves. You told us how big his feet were, but please describe how they looked for us. Well, it was kind of dark, but I could see just the fronts of them. And they were dark like the back, okay? It was almost like he had dark boots on. But I didn't notice any claws, but they were round. They were like dog pads. 
whereas the ones attached to what looked like arms had flanges, like, you know, flanges, we think of fingers, hanging down. But these things didn't have any kind of toes. They just kind of like stopped. And um, I remember the glare of the fire where it kind of looked like they were like shorter dog claws, probably about the thickness of your thumb on each. And I'm guessing there was maybe four, you know, because I just got a quick glance at them. I was more, I was more in awe about that tail for some reason. The tail just, just, I looked at that tail and it was like, goodness, look at that tail. You know, why you got a tail? You're what you are and you got a tail. But I've seen other pictures, medieval pictures, and all of them got tails on them too. So anyways, I guess it had to be, but the, the foot, I do know it, it had to have been at least as big around as the paper plate. That's what it reminds me of when I looked at it. A big old foot like. So I guess they're kind of a big footy thing too. But I didn't notice nothing weirder from the moment, really scary at the time. But we were just in awe. And really, I don't know why we ran from where we were at the time when the both of us, when it run off and the both of us looked at each other and said, what the H was that? And without even stopping to rationalize we just run and it wasn't like we even knew where we were going but we ended up at my friend's house and we went straight down to the basement and went into the bottom rooms down there and went to sleep there and got our stuff in the morning but we just didn't really have a lot of time to think it had been so cool but nobody seems to have pictures of these things and it can't be a cell phone picture you know you got to have one of the old pen tacks one thousands and get that zoom lens really zoomed up and take you a good picture and have something to scale it with that's the kind of pictures you need cell phone pictures are just crap you, you got to have the old good traditional cameras for something like this to really get a picture you could appreciate and i've got one of them old pentax one thousands one of my ex-wives always says that's how you Miss those Kodak moments, always having to adjust the lens every five minutes. But still, if you could take a picture, it'd be a good one. But you're always having to adjust the lens, and and I never did really learn how to work it good. But it'd have been nice to have been able to take a picture of each and every one of its body parts, mainly for my son, because you know I'm already 60 years old, and I've gotten to the point where I don't care who thinks I'm crazy. I kind of deserve to be crazy in a way. I'm not a threat to anybody's life or nothing, but, you know, I can be crazy in a good way. And somebody wants to say, yeah, he sees weird things out in the woods. I don't care. I still go out in the woods. I still catch a whole bunch of fish when I feel like it or go deer hunting when I want to. But I just wished I could have took some good pictures to be able to show people because deep down inside, I doubt I'll ever have one in my house on the wall because that'd make me feel bad because I probably shouldn't have done that. And I do hear they can find you if you do that. Don't know why they can, but that's why I think they, there's something supernatural about them. When this thing was around, it was like it understood. Here's two boys, two boys. I don't have to have any fear from. And it was just too big to be afraid of us. But I mean, it just seemed to have so much walking around sense, common sense. I don't have to tear these people limb from limb. What am I doing here? Let me get out of here. These two dumb old boys. Let me get away from them. But that's all it was. I know there's different kinds. And I don't, like I said before, I don't want nobody to get naive about it. You have to respect everything and learn how to deal with certain kind of animals. And um, I think these things have always been around, but they're very reclusive. They don't want people to know that they exist because we have a thing called a government. And the government comes in there and does their nasty stuff like killer bee experiments and stuff like that. You know, and um, we just don't need people messing with them. 
and I think these things would rather be reclusive and be on their own, but as houses and subdivisions and things get built in rural areas, that takes away all their space. And an animal, you know, if you know animals and understand them, take, for instance, a mountain lion. A mountain lion, a good size one, needs at least 120 miles every two days to be able to take care of all of its needs. And an animal as big as something like this, and if it were a carnivore, it would need a whole bunch of space, especially if it was trying to stay away from developed areas where people are. Because once you kill a person, that starts bringing attention to what happened. And you get these crazy investigators, people like me, thinking, well, let me go out here and see what I can find and digging around. And um, you don't want to bring attention to yourself. But, uh, yeah, I wished I'd have got to see its feet, but I surely didn't see them that, that closely. Oh, that's all right. We won't hold that against you. Like I said, with all the other details that you did notice and share with us, no, I think you did a really good job. You said he was close enough to touch when he stopped by you. Did you ever think about reaching out and trying to do that? At the time, no, I didn't. And in fact, when it first stepped up, I took a step back and it was still that close. I could have, I could have touched it because, you know, both my arms were bent, you know, and uh, I could have reached out and really grabbed a hold of it. But I was too much in awe of what I was looking at. And it was like, wow, what is this? It wasn't like I was looking at a beetle or something, you know, where I had to touch the beetles, you know, or something like that. But the thought never occurred to me, but it was that close where I could have, definitely. And I don't know what I would have done had I grabbed it. Okay, you're holding it. Now what? You going to pick it up? <laughs> but yeah, I, I could have, I just didn't. And uh, like I said, I only had about six to 10 seconds to really look this thing up and down. And if you think about it, everybody thinks, well, that's not very long. But if you think about it, a second is like 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. And that's five seconds right there. So that's a lot of time, really. But it was about six to 10 seconds that it was standing right there in front of me. And um, probably 10 seconds before we finally lost sight of the whole thing. And as soon as it cleared the opening, it was gone. It was gone. I thought it ran straight away because we probably didn't stand there for five seconds. It was like we run out as soon as it run out. You know, it's like we're running after it. But we never saw it or heard the thing. And as big and heavy as it looked, we should have been able to hear it running, at least them pads thumping the ground. I'm guessing if it runs, It'd be like a, either a racehorse or it would sound like it was galloping, but I think it'd be more like a racehorse or a greyhound on all fours. But yeah, I just, I don't know what I would have done had I touched it, but it was close enough to touch. But that might have caused it to think something else or something or reach over and smack me upside the head or something. But the thought never occurred to me at the moment to grab it. I think that's the way I was raised to where I've always sort of treated everything with caution before I get to know it. And I've always been bitten by dogs for some reason. Every dog I've ever seen as a kid used to have to bite me. So that's probably another reason I never touched it. But who knows? Well, between the two of us, Paul, I'm so glad you didn't reach out and try to touch him, too. Thank goodness. But having said that, Paul, it's about time for us to get out of here. But before we do, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Well, I'm just, like I've said two or three times before, just glad to have been able to share this with everybody. I would tell folks, if you see them, I don't necessarily think all of them are bad 
I don't know if that's a area thing from a different country or whatever or what, but don't be naive, okay? Treat things with respect, just like you would see a bear or something like that. Treat it that way. I wouldn't turn my back on one and run away from it. I would walk backwards. And just because I got a gun, unless I felt threatened, that's the only time I would use it. Okay. And then again, you better have something better than a 22 or a 410. You better have a 4570 with about a thousand pounds of knockdown at a hundred yards and not some pea shooter. But just don't go thinking that's what you're out there to shoot. Okay. Just because you can doesn't mean you have to. Treat everything with respect. You know, we're here to manage the animals here on this earth and treat things with respect. And um, just don't be naive, okay? They're out there. I've seen one. Other people have. I'm a 20-year Army veteran. That doesn't mean anything, really. But I've done a lot of things. And I do believe there's reasons for things that go bump in the night. And it goes far deeper than that. Digging around about these things has brought all sorts of other things in my radar screen. But I'm not worried about it, folks. Everything's fine. Just live a good life. Treat people with kindness and respect. And life is good. And I'm glad I, I was able to share this story with you. Thank you, Vic. Oh, you know you're welcome. Thanks again so much. Have a great night. If you've had a dogman encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you.